to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes, joined once again by our good friend Peter Weiner, contributing writer at The Atlantic and The New York Times, whose books include The Death of Politics, How to Heal Our Frayed Republic After Trump. And uh, Peter is a senior fellow at the Trinity Forum, and he served in the Reagan, Bush 41 and Bush 43 administrations. Good to have you back, Peter. Thanks, uh, Charlie. It's always great to be on the show and to have a conversation with you. Well, as you know, I struggle against, and I warn against, irrational exuberance or actually hopefulness of any kind, which is why I want to talk to you about this. In the first 24 hours after the reports of the the the, the Donald Trump, Kanye West, Nick Fuentes Nazi dinner, it looked like we were going to see the same old pattern of Republicans looking at their shoes, you know, pretending they didn't know about it, uh, you know, observing strategic silence. There are some indications that that may be changing. And, and again, I, you know, as I as I wrote in my newsletter, I, you know, dare I say it, 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 it feels a little bit hopeful. Let me just read you something from uh, Semaphore this morning. Trump's dinner party seemed to be going the way of prior Trump scandals over the holiday weekend. A lot of noise in the press, a handful of attention-getting condemnations from Republicans, but mostly silence within his party. On Monday, though, it became clear that this was not going to be another story that gets quietly swept under the rug. Overall, it was the most widespread Republican rebuke Trump has received since January 6th, and it came just two weeks after the former president launched his re-election campaign in three weeks after a disappointing midterm election that many Republicans blamed on Trump-backed candidates who voters perceived as extreme. Trump has made it through worse, and -and rank-and-file voters are the ultimate judge of his place in the party, but he also can't afford to bleed support when Republicans have other options in a competitive primary. So, Peter, I'm reading through the various condemnations, and they range from the tepid to the pretty strong Mitt Romney calling him a gargoyle, even Mike Pence saying that he should apologize for it. What do you make of this? Is this a crack or just a hairline fracture, or are you suffering PTSD from having lived through this so many times before? Yeah, I don't think it's the latter. I think it's a crack. Mm. I think I disaggregate what, what is was going on. Um, there's no question in my mind that the now GOP establishment, which is really a sort of MAGA uh, establishment, is breaking with him. And the precipitating event was not anything moral. It had to do with uh, with, with a perceived loss of power and the real loss of power, because the Republicans rightly understood that, that they haven't done well in elections because of, of Trump and this 2022 midterm results, I think had a big psychological effect on on the Republican establishment. And a lot of them were looking, uh, as you and I know, just from b- private conversations, they knew that, that Trump was a deeply disturbed person, um, but they were afraid to break with him. And I think this gave them the opportunity to break. And then this this dinner with Nick Fuentes and Kanye uh, West, yay, um, is, is, is another reason for them to do it. So I think that's, that's real. Uh, what we don't know is what was alluded to and what you read, which is How's the base of the party going to react to this? And that's just an unknown. There's not much doubt that there's been an erosion in Trump support. We've seen that in, you know, the focus groups that Sarah Longwell's done, which are so helpful. We've seen it in some of the polling data. That said, the real test is going to be elections. Um, And if, uh, you know, Trump is, is lasting and standing by the time the 2024 election primaries are seriously underway, And you have winner-take-all primaries. He only needs a certain percentage of the base to win. And um, people have consistently underestimated his hold on the base. That doesn't mean that there hasn't been some real erosion that's happened, but he started at a phenomenally high place, and he could afford to lose support. So how much of this is filtering down to the to the Trumpified, magnified base? We don't we don't know. The stuff can't help him. But I think right now, too many people are essentially burying him without sufficient evidence for that to happen. I think, you know, until the evidence to the contrary comes in, you have to assume that he is still the odds on favor to be the the nominee. The question we always have to ask is, is this new? Is this a real shift? Clearly, there's kind of a permission structure out there where other 
elected Republicans are kind of looking over their shoulder and going, OK, I can, I can denounce this. Uh, it's really not that hard to denounce, uh, you know, a neo-Nazi white supremacist uh, Holocaust denier. This is relatively easy. They they seem willing to do this. But you made an interesting point here that it seems like the Republican establishment is prepared to break with him. And and I guess let's break this down because we know that Trump has brushed aside the Republican establishment in, in the past, that he's co-opted or destroyed it, that they turned out to be completely feckless. But you made an interesting point that it's not just the old, you know, Bush establishment. When you talk about the establishment, you're talking about the MAGA establishment. And I guess that's the question is, what is the establishment in the party anymore? I mean, break it down. You have the old, you know, pre-Trump Republicans who maybe held their nose, you know, and, you know, five or six of us, you know, went off to never Trump land. But when you're talking about the establishment, you're talking about people who have uh, up until now been kind of loyal spear carriers for, for Trump. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, it's, it's it's a good question. It's It's somewhat paradoxical because a lot of MAGA world has been running against the establishment. Uh, qua establishment. That is, they they view themselves as revolutionaries. And in fact, they wouldn't acknowledge what is true, which is they themselves have become the establishment. What is that establishment now, six years after Trump won, won the nomination? I mean, it was it's the Murdoch empire, right, which is the Wall Street Journal, the New York Post, Fox News. Uh, it's talk radio. It's political institutions like the RNC. And then they're, they're elected officials um, in the House and the Senate and, and, and elsewhere. Um, and you used a, a good phrase, I thought, the sort of permission structure. And you can just tell that that's changing. People are speaking out. Bill Barr is, you know, is, is one example of, of several others. And they're signaling to each other that it's okay to be critical of him, even if you've been supportive of him in the past. You're not being a traitor. Um, so it's it's a fascinating sort of tribal dance that we're we're seeing. I think of that establishment, the most prominent part of it to turn against Trump is is the Murdoch Empire yes, because the, right. of the journal editorial page, which is still significant, uh, and the New York Post. But but I think above all, Fox Fox News, um, and you know that's can't help Trump. I mean, if they're basically freezing him out of Fox News and, and, and those shows are, are uh, celebrating and featuring DeSantis uh, and, and others, that can't, that can't help Trump. But Trump you know, had the entire establishment against him in 2015, 2016, up until it was clear that he was going to win the nomination. That didn't stop him. In some ways, it even helped him, I guess, uh, demonstrated his bona fides in a party that was somewhat revolutionary in its temperament. Said, well, look, let's go with this guy who's really to burn down the house. So it's really, really interesting to observe. And, you know, you and I, as people who have been critical of Trump uh, really since the get go, watching this unfold, it's a kind of fascinating thing to observe. It is fascinating. So you mentioned Bill Barr in the context of the permission structure to criticize uh, Donald Trump, but it comes with a, an asterisk, right? Because apparently this permission structure means you can criticize him, you can um, you know, be very harsh in your criticism, but the asterisk is as long as you say that you would support him again in 2024 if he were the nominee. I mean, that seems to be the caveat, which again is as mind-boggling as uh, as listening to Republicans back in 2016 who would say things like, yes, uh, you know, he's uh, you know, his comment is textbook racism, but uh, nevertheless, we should put him in the Oval Office. I mean, this is you have th th this has been that two step, right, that that as long as you pledge ultimate loyalty in the binary choice of the election, you still are, you know, able to criticize them. But it, it feels hollow. I mean, when Bill Barr says he's completely unfit to be the president, that he's delusional, and yet will suggest that despite the racism, the anti-Semitism, the dinner with Nazis, et cetera, that he'd be willing to support him for president again. I mean, they haven't moved past that yet, have they? No, they haven't. And I entirely agree. Uh, I'm glad. I'm, I'm, I'm very happy that, that the GOP establishment is breaking with Trump because, uh, I think he is such a malignant and malicious figure in American politics, unlike anything we've seen. And this is something that you and I have been arguing for and and, and calling for uh, and hoping for for a lot of years. So I, I'm, I'm glad they're turning right. against him. But I think there are important, I guess, qualifiers to that. One is what you said, which is, you know, Bill Barr basically said 
I think he actually did say that, that Donald Trump was unhinged, and yeah. essentially deranged after the election and the insurrection in 2021. And in the next breath, he said that he would vote for Trump if, if he were the Republican nominee in the blink of an eye. He did that during his, his book tour several months ago. That just doesn't parse morally. It doesn't parse ethically. It doesn't uh, parse in terms of the good of the republic. So you're quite right. Their view is we are going to vote a uh, Republican, uh, even if the person who is the nominee is 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 a monstrous figure, which which is true of Donald Trump. The other thing that is happening is that the break with Trump has been utilitarian. It's been in no sense a moral break, a realization of what a toxic, dangerous, threatening figure he was. The the the, the inflection point, the degree that we've seen it was because Republicans lost right. in the midterm. And in the past, they thought Trump was was the pathway to power, so they supported him no matter what he did. And now there's the perception that he's a block to power, so they're going to to break from him. The problem with that, apart from it being you know them being hollow men in terms of uh, the lack of any moral or ethical basis for their judgment, is that that can shift again if it becomes clear to them that that Trump can uh, can win then they'll line up around him again. I wanted to say one other thing. You, you, you're quite right. I mean, one of the tests here is is for Republicans, even if they're critical of Trump, to say that they would support Trump if he were the nominee in 2024. I think the other thing that is required uh, of these people who are now breaking with Trump is not to admit that the critics of Trump over the last six years were right. Yeah, they can't uh, do in, that. No. In any respect, uh, they can't bring themselves to uh, to say that. And I want to come back to that. The bar position makes no sense morally, but of course, it's completely consistent with what uh, Republican leaders have done over the last uh, five or six years, which is that no matter uh, what he has done, they will ultimately support his return to power. I mean, they they didn't break with him decisively after Charlottesville, after the Muslim ban, after after access Hollywood, uh, after I mean, the list is just so long after he tried to overturn the free and fair election. Etc. So why would uh, dinner with one of the you know most vile uh, neo Nazis in the country make that much of a difference? And you're right, it is utilitarian. You wrote about this break, and I think this is this is again the dilemma that Republicans have that that even if you have the donors, the the political operatives, even former you know White House staff members, even the Murdoch Empire, even if elected Republicans turn against them, as you point out in your piece in the Times. The break wouldn't come clean or easy. Trump likes running as an outsider. And when you look at the numbers, you still have I mean, about 40 percent of Republicans are always Trumpers, right? They, they will never abandon him. You get about 50 percent who are maybe Trumpers. So I guess, Peter, the question is, how does he go away? I just don't see the, the scenario. He's not going to graciously concede defeat to Ron DeSantis, right? He's not going to walk off into the sunset and say, OK, you know, that was fun. Um, now I'm going to go enjoy my the rest of my life down in Mar-a-Lago. Yeah, he's not going to go away. That is the one thing that I think we can we we can pretty much guarantee his psychological um, profile and disordered personality won't allow him to go away. And I think that one of the things that Republicans who are breaking with Trump haven't given sufficient thought to, and it may, may be uh, because it's, it's it's a thought that strikes fear into their hearts is that if Trump r runs uh, and doesn't win the nomination, um, I think he's going to try and burn down the Republican I Party. Agree. I think he mm -hmm. would turn against it with fury. Um, and he would tell his supporters to turn against it with fury. Now, not all of them would would uh, would do it, but not all of them have to do it. The elections are, are close enough that if any portion of the Republican Party, as it's currently constituted, turned against the Republican nominee in 2024 if it wasn't if it wasn't Trump whether they voted for a Democrat or third party or didn't vote uh, for the Republican nominee Republicans would really really suffer um, not just at the residential level but but uh, congressional governorships state state legislatures and all the rest uh, and Trump uh, has never been a party uh, man um, and really who knows his history knows knows that he he landed the Republican Party simply because that was the opening that he had. He could just as easily have, have run as a, as a Democrat. Um, and of course, we also know that, uh, that he has no loyalty to, to individuals, let alone to, to institutions or, or to political parties. 
And if the Republican Party uh, does turn on him, rejects him, that will psychologically be too much for him, and he'll he'll go on the warpath. And I do think he'll try and burn down the Republican Party. So are they stuck with him? Are they hostage to to his his derangement? As the old saying goes, between a rock and a hard place. Because if they nominate him, he's such a flawed, deeply flawed figure. And this is the reason they're breaking with him. They know that unless there are exceptional circumstances, he's not going to win the election in, in 2024. Uh, and they don't want that. They want somebody at the top of the ticket that they think can win. On the other hand, if they don't nominate him, if they turn against him, and he decides uh, to to uh, aim all of his fire and fury on the GOP. They're going to suffer there too. So you know, it's it's basically pick your poison. But but look, they're responsible for this. They created him. They supported him. They uh, bought this ticket. They're taking the ride now. So yeah, exactly. They propagated his lies. They allowed the base to get radicalized. And then they thought, well, you know, when the time comes, we're just going to hit the off switch. Uh, guess what? There's no off switch. So I, I do think that uh, that it's it's complicated for them, and and I think they don't quite know what to uh, what to do. What we do know is it'll be chaotic. Well, what's interesting is is watching some of the uh, anti anti Trumpers lining up behind uh, Ron DeSantis is kind of their golden ticket, uh, you know, out of Trump world. But here's the problem with Ron DeSantis. Maybe I need to come back to all of this. Ron DeSantis wants to run as you know, the second coming of Trump, which means that he cannot antagonize any part of that Trump base. He wants to inherit it. In fact, I, I think Baseball Crank at the National Review, you know, was, you know, National Review, which has now become kind of a fanzine for uh, Ron DeSantis, said, you know, the, the real trick for DeSantis is, is how do you not alienate, you know, the most hardcore Trump supporters? Um, and that means then not only um, not breaking uh, decisively with Trump himself, but also not denouncing these this troll base that that Donald Trump has 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 encouraged. And I think my real takeaway from uh, the Nick Fuentes dinner was whether or not Donald Trump knew who he was when he when he walked in the door. He certainly knew um, afterwards who he was. And he's refused to criticize him or denounce him. And the reason he's refused to criticize or, or denounce him is because he thinks that anti-Semitic racist troll base is a fundamental part of his base. And Republicans need to, if they're ever going to move past this, they're not just going to have to denounce Trump. They're going to have to go after that base, right? They're going to have to go after this Griper army, just the way William F. Buckley Jr. did it with the John Birch Society and the KKK back in the 1960s. And so far, Ron DeSantis hasn't figured out how to, how to finesse that, has he? He, he wants to run against Trump, but his silence is really parallel at this point to Trump's silence because he wants to keep that base in the base. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I mean, Ron DeSantis is in the easiest possible position right now that he'll ever find himself. He, he won um, uh, an overwhelming election in Florida. He's not running for the presidency yet. He gets to pick and choose what he says when he says it. And he's not not being targeted by by other Republicans, particularly he was for a short time by Trump. And Trump seems to have veered away from that, at least for now. And on paper, DeSantis looks formidable. But uh, there are a ton of people who have looked formidable on paper in presidential elections who, uh, who flamed out once they actually uh, ran. And we'll see how much dexterity and skill that DeSantis has. Just a couple of comments on him. I don't know if this is your impression, but my impression is that for an awful lot of people who are lining up behind Ron DeSantis now, they're doing it without actually having really seen or known much about Ron DeSantis. So they know him on paper. They know he did well uh, in, in, in Florida. They've seen him yelling at high school students who are wearing masks. Yeah. They've seen him bark at reporters in 20 second you know, sound clips. I don't know how many of them saw, for example, the the debate that he had with Charlie Chris. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm not convinced that he's a supremely great political talent. I think he's he's good. He's smart. He's clearly smart from everything that I know and from what others have said about him. But smart doesn't mean that you're going to be a good political candidate. So in a way, he's a slightly empty vessel in which a lot of people are investing their hopes uh, of what they think he is. That's very different from from what he may be. And, you know, I've, I've been in presidential campaigns of 
studied politics and presidential campaigns like like you have, uh, I can tell you there's nothing like running for president. Um, if you think running for governor or running for Senate is the same thing, you haven't done it before. It's a different league. Uh, we don't know how Ron DeSantis would do if he's on a debate stage with Trump and Trump turns that blowtorch. We don't know what's going to happen if he's asked, you know, to uh, break with some of the far right elements, right. QAnon elements, um, how much dexterity he has. So I agree with you. You know, the one person who is who is speaking out more and more is is Mike Pence. He did an interview the other day and said that, that Trump should apologize for you know for having hosted the dinner. But Pence isn't going to go anywhere. There's no, no. there's no uh, no lane for him to uh, to to go. Chris Christie is is doing the uh, the same thing. So I agree with you conceptually what what somebody like DeSantis or any other candidate is going to win has to do is they have to uh, not antagonize, not alienate the Trumpian base because that's the base of the Republican Party. They have to signal that they're different than Trump and they have to give a rationale for why the voters should vote for them rather than Trump. That's not an easy task. We'll see if DeSantis and others are up to it. Your point about uh, you know DeSantis being untested you know, needs to be underlined. It would be interesting to go back and write a piece about what presidential fields look like two years out from an election, um, because I believe that President Scott Walker would like a word, President Rudy Giuliani, uh, exactly. President Fred Thompson. Uh, remember when President John Connolly um, was running? Exactly. I mean, there there's a long list of people who look just fantastic on paper. Uh, remember President Rick Perry um, when he surged? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and all of these guys faded in the spotlight. The other problem that DeSantis has, though, is his strategy is is to you know go for the Trump base, prove that he can be as cruel and manipulative as Trump, that he can own the libs as effectively as 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 Trump, and it it worked for him in in Florida. But part of the trade off here is that by playing so hard to the base and being unwilling to take on this troll base, is the ongoing alienation of the swing voters, the suburban voters. So, you know, this is this, again, is part of the problem that what it takes to win a Republican primary is exactly what kills you in the general election. And that erosion continues. And I do I agree with uh, my colleague, Tim Miller, who says, you know, honestly, if if Republicans are thinking that the rest of the country has this uh, this bottomless appetite for what's going on in Florida, I'd like to see what they are actually smoking, because I'm not sure that the things that are appealing right now about DeSantis in Florida are going to play well in Pennsylvania and in Michigan and in Wisconsin and Minnesota and Arizona and Nevada, the states that are going to determine who wins the 2024 election. Yeah, I think that's I think that's right. And there's this interesting and I think for for Republicans uh, alarming phenomenon, which is which is playing out, which is the base of the party is much more radicalized now than it was even during the Trump years uh, when you when you look at what happened after January 6th and all of the craziness and insanity that's unfolded and, and you see it in people like uh, Herschel Walker and, and that whole slate of election deniers that, that were defeated in the 2022 midterm election. So they're going further and further into dark and ugly places. Um, and that if people aren't willing, uh, if candidates aren't willing to uh, stand up against that, a lot of swing voters, as you say, are going to say, look, this is this is easy. If you can't do this, then I don't want anything to do with you. But it's precisely because this is an energized part of the, of, of, of the Republican Party that going after them is going to really tick that portion, that wing of the party off. So it's tricky. And uh, again, this is something that they've created. They've made this bed. Now they have to uh, to lie in it. And of course, this is not just a problem for the Republican Party. I think we need to step back for a moment. And and the more that I think about, you know, the, the events of of the last week, um, look, anti-Semitism has been a problem in this country for a very, very long time. There's no question about it. It is not new, but there is something new that's going on right now. And the, the fact that we're focusing on Nick Fuentes rather than the fact that the former president wanted to have this millionaire rap superstar who's also one of the most virulent anti-Semites to dinner in itself is a bad landmark. Michelle Goldberg, I've been thinking about her column um, all night, and she talks about the fact that maybe we've become numbed to all of this. And, you know, you and I have, you know, dealt with anti-Semitism for you know, many, many, many years, but there is a new, there's a new threat 
and it is bigger than anything that I've experienced in my life. So this is what Michelle Goldberg wrote in the Times. For most of my adult life, anti-Semites, with exceptions like Pat Buchanan and Mel Gibson, have lacked status in America. The most virulent anti-Semites tended to hate Jews from below, blaming them for their own failures and disappointments. Now, however, anti-Jewish bigotry, or at least tacit approval of anti-Jewish bigotry, is coming from people with serious power, the leader of a major political party, a famous pop star, and the world's richest man. Such anti-Semitism still feels, at least to me, less like an immediate source of terror than an ominous force offstage, just as it was for the comfortable Austrian Jews in Stoppard's play. Maybe this time, for the first time, it won't get worse. So I guess this is the moment where you have to go, okay, you know, this, this beast has been out there. We have looked the other way as it's been nurtured. Interesting headline in the New York Times today. Jewish allies call Trump's dinner with anti-Semites a breaking point. And the subhead is supporters who look past the former president's admirers and bigoted corners of the far right and his own use of anti-Semitic tropes now are drawing the line. He legitimizes Jew hatred and Jew haters, says one. And this scares me. Okay, so Peter, better late than never, but this is kind of a like, oh shit moment for a lot of these folks, that this has consequences. You make a really important point, which is we're focusing on the effects on the Republican Party, but the most important thing is the moral condition of the country. Yeah, a lot of these these people uh, are, you know, are shocked, shocked that Trump has gone in this direction and these um, ugly and dark forces and passions have been have been unleashed. And this was so predictable. You could see this coming six years ago. That was really one of the main reasons why it was important to stand up to Trump early on and to do it in a a unified way before he had secured power. And even after he had power, to stand up and say, look, there's some lines that, that, that you can't cross. Because if you succumb to it, if you turn the other way or if you amplify those charges, you defend him, always engage in whataboutism, it has a, a, a tremendously corrosive effect on the civic and political culture of the country. And that's something you and I remember that. I mean, when, when, when we were young and uh, really became part of the conservative movement, that was one of the essential elements of conservatism, which was not necessarily the policy and the, and the political realm per se, but the civic and political culture of a country, the institutions of a country, the moral sentiments of a country, the Republican virtues that are necessary for a free republic to survive. And conservatives used to believe that you had to attend to those and, and, and nurture those. Um, and not only is that have they given up on that, it's been the exact opposite. And now we're seeing it play out and it, it's locating itself right now in a really nasty and ugly place, which is anti-Semitism. Um, but it's not going to stop there. Um, because this, this is, these are like lightning bolts. They're going to strike someplace, uh, and they're going to strike, in fact, in many different places. And it's anti-Semitism right now. It'll be someplace else later down the road. That's what happens when these kind of passions are unleashed. The founders worried about this, and so did Lincoln in his Young Men Lyceum speech. That's always been one of the great dangers of of democracy, which is what happens when ugly passions are unleashed and demagogues come onto the uh, onto the scene and and you lose control of um, of this. And I agree too that all of us to some degree have have gotten inured to this. And that's understandable psychologically, because otherwise you would just be in a perpetual state of outrage and fear and concern for the country. So we've kind of inured ourselves to it, and 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 we know what Trump is like, and we know how this these this moral freak show you know plays out. But it's also important at the same time to take a step back now and and then and to see just how far we've fallen and just how dangerous this stuff is. Right now, it's in the bloodstream, and it's going to take a lot of time and effort and some degree of luck to try and uh, and drain it. And again, this was predictable. This is not something that just happened as a one-off. I I know that you remember 2015 and 2016. You know, back then, Trump's flirtation with the alt-right, with the anti-Semitic right, um, you know, with the Daily Stormers of of the world, 
was an issue. And, you know, when I wrote my you know book back in, which now seems like a kinder, gentler, more naive era, you know, how the right lost its mind, there's a lot in there about Donald Trump's empowerment and encouragement to the anti-Semites. After one of the mass shootings, I wrote a piece for the Weekly Standard, Trump's uh, anti-Semitism problem and, and ours and, and the, the consequence of these ideas. This has been building for years. The other point I think that's important to stress here is that the modern conservative movement, which I would trace back to Buckley and the National Review, was very much focused on ridding the right of the cancer of anti-Semitism. This was something that that William F. Buckley Jr. was obsessed about because, you know, in fact, he he banned anyone who wrote for the uh, publication uh, known as the American Mercury from ever appearing in National Review. And the American Mercury was just, you know, a, a sort of a cesspool of Jew hatred. And this was a real problem. And I think the conservatives realized that if there was ever going to be a future for American conservatism, it needed to purge itself and cleanse itself of this anti-Semitism. And that was a project that took decades and it has all been undone or much of it has been undone by the willing embrace of Trump or at least the tacit acceptance of what Trump has done to anti-Semites because they are out there, they are big, and people think we're exaggerating. It's because you probably do not inhabit those fever swamps out there that are becoming much, much more influential in Republican politics. Yeah, that's a poignant description, and you're quite right. I mean, you'll remember when Buckley broke with Buchanan, it was in the early 1990s, and that was a big deal within the uh, conservative movement and the interconservative debate um, because Buckley felt like Buchanan had had crossed the line in terms of, of anti-Semitism and Buchanan's anti-Semitism wasn't as undisguised as what we're seeing now. It was bad enough, but it's worse now. I'm curious, do you think that the people who are now expressing shock at, at what's happened are genuinely shocked by it? Or do you think that they're just saying that? Or do you think it's a complicated mix of um, of both? I think that's a very interesting question. I always try to figure out what what are people's motivations? What do they actually think? And I think the answer is probably the third. Uh, it, it's a complicated mix. I, I think that there have been people who have been shocked by it, uh, maybe horrified by it, but um, unwilling um, or simply afraid uh, to speak out that muscle memory of cowardice. On the other hand, there is that moment where you go, okay, I thought I could keep this under control. I didn't think that the alligator would come out and eat me. There's a certain reduction to absurdity where, well, what if you had Donald Trump have dinner with an actual neo-Nazi? Would that be too far? Right. They've swallowed it all thinking, okay, I can sort of put this in a box in the corner and I don't need to worry about it. And this maybe is a little bit too much in your face. So I think that there's some genuine shock. But of course, as you pointed out, there's also just the sort of the rank cynical opportunism of people who have swallowed all of this until they start to lose elections. And so who knows? People are complicated. That's a helpful answer. I I think that cognitive dissonance is a hard thing for anybody to live with. And the mind has this tremendous capacity to rationalize and to excuse our conduct and our attitudes and what we what we embrace. But it is a really fascinating test. I mean, if you go back to what happened at Charlottesville, which was 2017, and there was condemnation, as you'll recall, from yeah. Republican leaders, from, you know, Paul Ryan and I, I think Mitch McConnell and, and several others. And we're way beyond Charlottesville at this at this point. And it does show you how how people accommodate themselves and how one accommodation gives way to another accommodation, which gives way to another accommodation. And before you know it, you've gone down really dark, uh, dark alleyways. Well, exactly. And again, you know, can anybody really be shocked? This is a man who brought uh, Steve Bannon and Stephen Miller into the White House. I mean, we, you know, I, again, every single thing here was done in the open. None of this was a, a secret. And so I guess this, uh, this really tests their capacity for denial, which has been pretty amazing, the, the degree to which they can engage in, in denialism. I mean, how many years did Paul Ryan spend saying, well, I didn't read the tweets. I never read the tweets. And, well, and again, I don't know whether you feel this way, but I am prepared to lower the bar and open the gates a little bit, that if you're willing to speak out now, 
let's not relitigate all of the failures in the past. I, I think it's a good thing that they are speaking out. Although for those of us who have taken the slings and arrows for seven years and been derided and sneered at by many of the anti-anti-Trumpers, how should we think about, you know, all of those emphatic supporters uh, of Donald Trump until that moment they decided, well, wait, maybe he's a loser. What should we think about these people? Yeah, it's a really intriguing question. Um, I agree with you. I mean, if people are willing to take an exit ramp from the Trump highway, then they should do it and we should celebrate that they're doing it. We should be glad that they're that they're doing it because it was just the essential first step that was required to uh, get the country back on course, get the Republican Party back on course, to get conservatism back on course, if all of those things are in fact, uh, you know, rectified and, and straightened out. So that's important to do. I do think that at the same time, it's important and fair to critique where those people have been and what's motivating them now. I mean, we talked earlier about about the fact that their judgment is not moral, it's it's utilitarian. Uh, and so presumably, if they're convinced that Trump could win, they would rally around him again. And that's, that's then an, an act of danger. And it also means that there isn't a, a lot of credit that is due for them to getting off of this exit. It's not as if they've had a, a, a revelation of any kind, any, any contemplation, self-reflection, um, a sense that they had missed something important. It's just like, look, this guy is now useless to us or he's actively harmful to us. So we got to throw him to the, to the curb, but it doesn't mean that they wouldn't do this again. Or if there's a, another figure comparable to Trump, but with less baggage, they wouldn't rally around him. So I think that's important too. And then there's just sort of basic, I, I don't know, maybe this is some degree of, of good graces, which is, uh, if, You've been attacking people for five, six, seven years for making essentially the same critique you're making now to try and explain what it is that they missed about it. What do you see now that you didn't see before? Because as we've talked about, none of this is surprising with Donald Trump. There was almost an inevitability to it to it going here. Um, and it would be helpful and I think impressive for 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 a few of the never never Trumpers who who are now uh, sort of wel welcome to the resistance to reflect on on that. I think it's hard for them for two reasons. One is uh, it's not easy for any of us to admit that we were wrong, and so I think there's there's this tendency to just skip over that that part of the process, just to say we were with him, but he's changed and he's a loser, and now we're we're against him. So they don't want to admit that they were wrong on any deep or fundamental sense or that they missed something important or that they were morally blind to certain things. The other thing that I think is even harder than admitting that they were wrong is to admit the people that they had been attacking for the last four or five, six years were right. I think that's even psychologically more difficult because there was so much energy, uh, so much antipathy um, <clears throat> that's that's been uh, aimed at critics of Trump. And those sensibilities have been has have been shaped, and to now uh, say, look, maybe there was there was a point. Maybe those critics saw things that that we didn't. Is probably asking too maybe. much of 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 them. Well, and as a never Trumper from before, there was never or never Trump. I, I do find myself thinking about the prodigal son story. Yeah. Um, you know, we've been out here taking the slings and arrows, and and then these guys uh, just sort of show up and everything, and they want the fatted calf. But they're going to have to be strange alliances, and, and we're going to have to um, uh, welcome back people that we've been alienated from, I think, to get to get through all of this. And I say this as somebody that until about a year ago, uh, here in, in, my, in my basement study, had a picture on the wall. I'm embarrassed to even tell this story. Picture of me with Ted Cruz <laughs> right before the 2016 Wisconsin primary saying, I will do anything I can to beat Donald Trump. And if that meant supporting Ted Cruz, which, by the way, is a choice that does not age well, does I do not <laughs> feel better over time. But, you know, um, I'm, I'm sure that there were a lot of people that felt that way about uh, about Joseph Stalin in World War Two. OK, I went there. Um, but there's going to have to be those moments where we're going to have to make that uh, that common cause. And it's not going to be easy for anybody. You know, I think that's well stated. I I think it's important to do because it's it's important for the good of the country and the and the good of this movement that we care about, and so um, it's it's good in every respect. 
to be able to welcome people back. And beyond that, there's this point about grace and about reconciliation. We've all failed. We've all made misjudgments. Um, I certainly have, uh, too. Um, and you, um, you don't want those things to, to, uh, you know, be a millstone around your neck, um, all the time. Again, I, I do think it would be helpful. And I think it's important in some moral sense for a realization, uh, of, of what was missed, partly because if, if there isn't that this can play out again, if it's simply for utilitarian reasons, if it's simply for, uh, for power, uh, then, then, uh, the, the right lessons haven't, you know, haven't been learned. No, I think um, exactly so I think right. it's, it's completely fair and legit to, to be able to have those conversations and to say to the people who are now as are joining the resistance to, to reflect, but it doesn't have to be said with bitterness and, or acrimony. It doesn't have to be said in a way that, that signals we never want you or, you know, that you're irredeemable or anything like that. Um, I'm a person of the Christian faith. You are as well. And grace is a central uh, concept and, and we've all benefited from it. Uh, and when you've been the recipient of grace, you're able to extend grace to, to others. And hopefully I'll be able to, to do that. I think it's the right thing to do. So one last note here, just changing gears a little bit. Um, you wrote a very, very powerful, moving, and eloquent remembrance of Mike Gerson, who died from cancer about two weeks ago. And uh, Mike was a uh, columnist for the Washington Post, previously a speechwriter for George W. Bush. And and really, you know, in, in many ways, a voice of conscience in a very difficult time. And you obviously were very, very close with Michael. I mean, he's going to be, his voice, I think, is going to be uh, terribly missed uh, over the next few years. Yeah, th- uh, thanks for mentioning him. He was he was a tremendous friend and a cherished friend of, of mine. You know, C.S. Lewis once described uh, friends as joining like raindrops on a window. And that happened with Mike and me, really the first time that I met him, which was in the 1990s. Uh, and we worked together. We were colleagues. We wrote books together. We did essays together. Uh, there were times where we would talk two or three times uh, a day. Um, and he was a remarkable person. Um, he was he wrote like an angel, just a beautiful, beautiful writer, one of the most gifted speech writers, uh, presidential speech writers uh, in generations and generations. Uh, he was a voice of, of conscience. Uh, he was a person who, who had a deep moral center. And he acted on that because of, of his efforts and the efforts of others, but, but very much because of Mike's efforts. The Global AIDS Initiative went forward, and 20 million people are alive today because of uh, the PEPFAR, which President Bush uh, had, had signed into law. And, and Mike was, was uh, a person that pushed very hard for that in the Bush administration. And he was always trying to work out in a serious and thoughtful way, you know, the moral implications of, of, of his views and politics and, and culture. And then he was a person of, of, of deep Christian faith. I mean, the, the litany of illnesses that he has had was just remarkable. He had a heart attack when he was 40. He had kidney cancer in 2013 um, that metastasized into lung cancer, adrenal cancer, finally bone cancer. He was struggling with Parkinson's disease. He had dealt with depression for most of his adult life. Um, and yet in the last several uh, weeks of his life, and I saw him three times uh, in the last uh, two weeks and, and, and other people saw him, um, when he was at Georgetown hospital, the through line uh, of those conversations was gratitude. Um, Hmm. he was deeply grateful for, um, the life that he was able to live, uh, and the people who were able to, to, uh, to be part of that journey and to see a person, um, moving toward death and struggling with not just cancer, but a particularly painful kind of cancer. And yet having a heart and a disposition of gratitude was a remarkable thing to see. Um, his faith was part of that because he knew that that this was not the end of the story, that there was a new and glorious chapter ahead. Um, but it was also a testimony to just a basic character um, of um, of his. He, he lived a consequential life and, and a lovely life mm-hmm. and it left its imprint on, on a lot of people. Um, preeminently uh, his his family, but very much mine too. And 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 uh, I miss him a, a lot. 
Well, we should all be so fortunate as to have a friend like you to provide this kind of remembrance. And by the way, on my desk here, as we are speaking, I have uh, the book that you co-wrote uh, with uh, with Michael Gerson, City of Man, Religion and Politics in a New Era, which uh, I strongly recommend and think it's probably due for a rereading. Peter Weiner, thank you so much for coming back on the podcast. I appreciate it very much. I always enjoy the conversation, Charlie. Thanks so much. The Bulwark Podcast is produced by Katie Cooper with audio production by Jonathan Siri. I'm Charlie Sykes. Thank you for listening to today's Bulwark Podcast. And we'll be back tomorrow to do this all over again.